Hi, I'm Eileen Martin. I'm an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. And I'm Nate Lindsay. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. We're going to talk about distributed acoustic sensing and some of the advances over the last four or five years. Distributed acoustic sensing is a new type of geophysical method that has developed in the oil and gas industry and is now being used to study earth systems. So Eileen and I chose to present this tutorial to uh, the AGU fall meeting in 2018 in order to uh, bring uh, some of what we've understood about this method to the AGU. Three takeaway bullet points from today's talk are that most seismic studies record inherently aliased data. For seismic data sets, this might limit our ability to study Earth systems, uh, particularly at scales that are much smaller than uh, conventional seismic networks. Second, distributed acoustic sensing is enabling repeatable seismic studies over long distances with dense sensor spacing, up to uh, as small as uh, less than a meter between sensing points over tens of kilometers of length. So this really is enabling new types of studies within our sciences. And thirdly, we have to be aware of how the instrument records our seismic wave fields, effects of installation, and also challenges with working with such a large multi-terabyte data set. First, we'll describe some motivation for why one would want to use DAS and why this is an emerging field. Then we'll discuss the measurement principle of this fiber optic sensing method, show some basics about the field work and what it takes to actually do a DAS experiment, and then discuss applications and use cases from industry, earthquake seismology, and also ambient noise seismology. When we think about studying Earth systems, there are kind of two length scales that we're interested in. First is the aperture, or the maximum length across the, the experiment. And second is the minimum resolution, or the distance between two sensing points. So whether it's the cryosphere, or the deep ocean, or fault boundaries uh, on continents or offshore, there are processes going on that are difficult to study with conventional seismic data sets. Shown in the center, a recent study by Schmant and Clayton and many other uh, contributors take over 5,000 three-component geophones into Long Beach in Southern California, and over 10 kilometers of aperture spaced out the geophones about 100 meters apart. And they were able to see fault-trapped waves, also uh, local earthquakes that were propagating through the region, and amplification due to uh, the fault zone. So on the far right, we're showing a DAS a recording of the uh, magnitude 8.1 uh, Mexico event from 2017, recorded in Sacramento, California, across the Earth Teleseismic Recording. The sensors here are each row plotted as an image in the background in blue and red, uh, each trace over seven and a half kilometers. We have 3,500 sensors uh, spaced apart by two meters. And so this is a, uh, roughly two orders of magnitude uh, shorter sensor spacing than the Long Beach Array. And so the ability to uh, study soil processes in the near surface scattering, uh, in addition to water table uh, and other, other pieces of the seismic wave field, this is a, a good example of, of the comparison of, of these different length scales. Fiber optic sensing has really begun uh, when we start thinking about total internal reflection. With light uh, illuminating that, that water, you can see how the light is actually trapped inside the water as it leaves the tank. And this was proven over, over 150 years ago. Uh, but with the introduction of laser and fiber optics, we were able to send coherent photon packages uh, with a very stable narrow band wavelength. Uh, down a glass tube, which has a different index of refraction from a surrounding coating. And by trapping the laser light with the same principle as shown here with this water tank, we can send pulses of laser light up to hundreds of kilometers length. And this is how the modern telecommunications industry sends and receives signals uh, related to the internet, for example. In the 70s and uh, early 80s, there was an expansion to reduce the loss in fiber optic cables 
to send that laser light even further. This enabled kind of an introduction of sensing technologies that would be able to cover uh, large lengths. The use of Bragg gratings to, uh, to actually introduce an etched scattering point inside of the fiber that would act as a discrete scattering point for the laser light meant that you could send and receive a uh, signal from that Bragg grading point and know where you were in the fiber. This kind of Bragg grading technology predates the distributed sensing technology that we're using, which doesn't actually need that embedded scattering point at all, but can just use the standard telecommunications cable. Distributed temperature sensing has been around for about two decades. Uh, it's been used in environmental surface process studies. Distributed temperature sensing uses a, uses a different type of photonics of uh, Raman and Brillouin scattering, uh, where the more recent development of DAS, distributed acoustic sensing, which we'll be discussing here, uses Rayleigh scattering. Next, we'll discuss the measurement principle. Inside of that core of the fiber optic cable that I was describing, there's actually variations in index of refraction because the silica glass is not perfect. So these colors in the top right show changes in index of refraction inside that core. When you pass a train of photons into uh, this fiber optic cable, there's Rayleigh scattering uh, due to the changes in index of refraction. And some of that light travels back to the interrogator. So it's the time of flight of uh, that, that photon that we're actually using to study uh, the motion of the cable. As the train of photons moves out into the fiber, specific photons come back to, uh, to the detector, but the train of photons continues to move down the, down the cable, allowing us to measure the entire length of the cable with a single laser pulse and look at changes in that scattering over time with multiple trains of photons. This method is essentially akin to the optical time domain reflectometry method. So there are different ways to analyze the backscattered light. Uh, we, can, we can actually measure the phase or the phase change uh, between repeated laser pulses. We can also measure this in the frequency domain. And this leads to inherent differences in the actual data that we record, but uh, the same principles uh, discussed above is the same. The photonics of DAS is Essentially, you can think of it as a Michelson interferometer. So this kind of standard tool from high school physics uh, measures changes in a sensing arm uh, with a single laser pulse that uh, is coherent, and so the phase is maintained if the sensing arm is the same length as the reference arm. But if the sensing arm is moved, perhaps by a seismic wave, then we can detect that, that length change through an interference pattern formed by the reconstruction of the, of the recorded signals. And so DAS is actually a bit more complicated than this. Uh, signals come from Rayleigh scattering inside of a fiber optic cable instead of uh, reflection off of these mirrors. And we're actually going to measure the strain or the change in length of that sensing arm over multiple overlapping potentially gauges or lengths of the fiber. And we're going to do that by keeping, a, keeping track of the time since the laser pulses have left the original interrogator. And so we do a bookkeeping exercise to, to understand where we're receiving light back from in the fiber. So here we're showing a comparison to geophones. DAS is essentially the difference of two geophones over time. Uh, this is one convention described by Daly et al. 2016. If we just break down what the Daly paper describes, it's the difference of two geophones um, over multiple pulses of, of light that we analyze. You can reconstruct this uh, using geophones. In orange is plotted the difference of two geophone data uh, compared to what the DAS is recording with a strain, so an integration of strain rate. And you can see for different frequency bands for an earthquake, the comparison is very good, both in uh, frequency and amplitude of, of arriving phases. There are important implications for, for this method. The maximum aperture is actually set by scattering inside the fiber. At present, in kind of standard telecommunications cables, we've seen that it's been about 25 uh, kilometers. Also, the standard difference in space between uh, the geophones is measured with this uh, quantity that we're calling gauge length. Conventionally, we've seen uh, 10 meter gauge length as, a, as an example gauge length. Taking the difference of two neighboring velocity sensors is pretty much the same as taking the finite difference approximation, the spatial derivative, 
of a velocity wave field, which is to say, taking a strain measurement. So this isn't a new idea. Going back to 1935, there was a paper by Benioff studying linear strain seismographs, and many of the characteristics that he saw in the change from particle velocity, uh, where the response here to different plane waves is marked in dashed lines for both longitudinal and transverse waves, many of those features are the same as what we see in our uh, DAS data. So if we add on looking at longitudinal waves with pointwise axial strain rate measurement, we see that the strain is much more pinched. It follows this cosine squared term of sensitivity instead of a cosine sensitivity term. On the right, we see the transverse waves, which have a sine of the angle of incidence sensitivity for velocity, now have a sine of theta times cosine of theta sensitivity to plane waves coming from a variety of different angles. One important feature when we're looking at these transverse waves is that if we have a 90 degree rotation of our sensor, we actually expect to get a complete sign flip at the same amplitude, something that's totally different from the velocity sensor. Additionally, the strain measurement will emphasize sources at the 45 degree angles instead of at 90 and 270 degrees. So we're emphasizing different sources. It's important to consider how this will affect our results for seismic imaging and earthquake detection. So another way to look at this uh, sensitivity to longitudinal waves for a particle strain measurement would be to lay out a bunch of different sources as Pap et al. did in 2016. So here they've ordered data recorded by a fiber optic along with data recorded by an accelerometer for angles of incidence from the source ranging from 0 to 180 degrees. What you want to notice here is that for the accelerometer velocity measurements, there's kind of a slow die-off from 0 to 90 degrees and then a slow growth back up to 180 degrees on the amplitudes. But for the fiber, it's a much steeper decay going away from 0 degrees because of this cosine squared of theta trend instead of cosine of theta. There's another aspect of working with distributed acoustic sensing, and it's setting the gauge length, or the distance over which we measure the average axial strain rate. So what you see down below, uh, in the bottom right is this sort of dashed box. The general rule of thumb is, if your minimum wavelength of interest is at least twice your gauge length, you're probably able to approximate your DAS data reasonably well with a pointwise uh, axial strain rate approximation. Now to increase these sort of blind spots or blind directions of sources, a number of scientists have started considering helically wound fibers, which have some sensitivity to both broadside waves and inline waves. Additionally, this recent work by Ning and Sava has considered having a group of multiple fibers that are all helically wrapped so that they can actually invert back not just the axial strain rate, but all six components of the strain tensor at each location and really piece apart those different spatial contributions. A real advantage of a DAS system is that it has this broadband instrument response. Much of the early work was working on vertical seismic profiling in the oil and gas industry. This is typically 10 to hundreds of hertz frequency range, or 0.001 to 0.1 second periods. Later, scientists started looking at automobile traffic as a potential source of passive seismic uh, energy that can be used for near-surface imaging. So these are periods of about 0.2 to 0.05 seconds. Later, we started looking at earthquake seismology and whether we could use DAS at much lower frequencies or longer periods to detect earthquakes both locally as well as longer teleseismic earthquakes, going out as far as even 100-second periods sometimes. At the extreme end of even lower frequency, longer period, are some of the hydraulic pumping tests done by Becker and colleagues, where they actually used a hydraulic pump to run a very slow uh, sinusoidal curve in their pump, uh, causing a slow signal to show up also on their DAS instrument at much lower frequencies than what anyone else had been uh, using. On the right, you see an example of a large magnitude 7.9 earthquake recorded in on a DAS array in Sacramento, California. The left side of this shows a Garalp seismometer, just a traditional seismometer, and a strong fundamental mode Rayleigh wave that's longer than a 10 second period. On the right, you see the response on the DAS unit at the same location. It has that same very strong fundamental Rayleigh wave mode 
And if we look at this in the time domain, you see very good agreement between uh, the seismometer data and the DAS, which has been converted into equivalent velocity units. The period here is roughly 20 seconds. A major consideration in this type of acquisition and its sensitivity has to do with fieldwork and experimental design. So as we've been describing, a single mode fiber can be plugged into what's called an interrogator unit, which is going to send and receive the laser pulses and calculate the backscattered energy uh, to convert to this array strain or strain rate data. So shown here, there's different types of interrogators made by Optisense, Silixa, and Schlumberger. There's also an interrogator being designed uh, at Livermore National Lab. So the flexible array geometry is really an advantage of DAS. Uh, we can think of digging in our own fiber optic cable in a trench, uh, shown in the top left at the Richmond Field Station, and, or we can use uh, existing telecommunications cable, as shown in the bottom right uh, at the Goldstone site in JPL. So this is really a, uh, both an advantage in terms of the fact that the sensor, the, the fiber optic cable, is already in the ground in some cases and can be just used for science. Uh, but it's also a challenge because, as you can see uh, in the case of the Stanford Array, for example, um, which Eileen has worked on, uh, it's kind of a figure eight shape that goes through campus. And so there are jogs and corners and turns along this cable, uh, which uh, needs to be used um, and, and understood in order to actually make sense of the data set. Second from the far left on the top row, a vertical seismic profile is shown where it's a, a single straight uh, vertical well and also a deviated well um, on the bottom of the seafloor. And the fiber inside this well provides uh, the sensor for a seis vertical seismic profile. And we included this because it's a good example of uh, what's been used in uh, the oil and gas industry to do vertical seismic profiles to replace or complement uh, geophone arrays. To deploy the cable in the field requires digging a trench first if you want to design your own uh, geometry for a DAS experiment. They've been buried as, as shallow as 10 centimeters to uh, one meter we don't see dramatic changes in the coupling. Connecting the fiber optic cables together uh, requires a, a standard splice kit where one can cleave and, and clean the fiber and then mate them together uh, so that the photons have uh, low loss across that, that junction. In the case where a telecommunications cable is used, the geometry can be tricky because the understanding of where exactly that fiber optic cable is, for instance, on one side of the rail or the other, uh, is not known uh, by the geophysicist who's now going to make use of the cable. Uh, it was known originally when the cable was buried, and so the use of uh, as-built drawings are uh, quite helpful in this case. On the far right, you can see uh, Ethan Williams and also Craig Ulrich uh, hammering at the locations of the fiber optic cable and then taking GPS waypoints to establish geometry for the data set, which channel um, corresponds to which location on Earth. Fiber packaging leads to minor differences. In the top right, I'm showing the conduit and uh, the, the fiber packaging as two separate pieces of uh, how the fiber is installed inside the ground. Packaging refers to the material that is covering the fiber optic cable, and the conduit refers to some tubing that the, that the fiber might be placed in, in the case of a uh, telecommunications situation. On the bottom left, uh, these data show that the, the, the packaging, the, the, uh, the fiber itself and the buffered cable or a Kevlar jacketed cable, um, all have roughly the same time domain waveforms and uh, generally the same uh, spectral content. We've tested this in the field with different types of fiber optic cable, including uh, tactical cables and um, simple uh, multi-mode single-mode cables, and we've seen consistent spectra. But when it comes to the conduit, or the, the way that the fiber optic cable is uh, coupled to the soil column, uh, we find larger differences. And this has been uh, seen in the lab, uh, shown on the, on the bottom left, uh, with the uh, staples and sandbag case showing much lower sensitivity to a broad range of frequencies when compared to putty, uh, which would be a better coupled uh, cable.
And on the right, we're showing uh, a single earthquake with three different install conditions, uh, showing important differences in terms of specifically what looks like long period response to uh, the seismic wave field. So the cased conduit uh, seems to have this longer period energy uh, arriving after 250 seconds on the late part of the waveform. And these, these coupling, under, um, understanding the coupling seems to be very uh, important part of each experiment and is still an open area of investigation. So next, Eileen is going to talk about some industry use cases. So one of the earliest applications in the oil and gas industry to really start maturing with DAS was vertical seismic profile imaging. So these are imaging experiments where a fiber optic cable or some geophones are dropped down a vertical well or installed in a vertical well permanently. Then active seismic sources are set off. Those sources are recorded on these sensors and then the data are migrated to tell us about geologic structure. So in cases like land imaging, which are quite difficult, we actually see a very good comparison between geophone data and DAS data, even back in early versions of the technology in 2013. In the center, you see an example where uh, large-scale VSP imaging was made possible offshore in deep water with an interesting sort of curving geometry where they were able to get the fiber to cover the entire well while recording every single shot, something that you cannot do with a small set of geophones. The real goal of a lot of this imaging was to do time-lapse imaging, seen on the right. Um, in time-lapse imaging, oil and gas companies are interested in seeing velocity changes due to production. That's changes in saturation, in what type of fluid is there, or geomechanical changes. What they've been able to see is that uh, the density of DAS and the ability to cover the entire well has been incredibly valuable uh, in these repeat surveys for having highly reliable, geologically interpretable changes, even when using smaller sources Another application that's been growing quickly in the oil and gas area is microseismicity detection and location. So on the left, you see an example from 2013 where Shell was doing uh, some hydraulic fracturing experiment. This is an overhead view in the top left of a series of wells that are buried mostly horizontally, um, and fiber goes down some of those. In the middle, you see a picture of both a P and an S wave arrival on this entire well. So even where the well is curving from being vertical to where it goes horizontal, you see this. They were able to use these data to locate the events based on those PNS wave arrival times. More recently, analysis of these microseismic events has gotten more advanced, not just locating events, but also starting to look at the source mechanism, the orientation of the fracture planes that are creating those microseismic events. On the right is a study by uh, Optisense and Devon Energy where you can see both a P arrival and an S arrival throughout a very dense DAS array. Um, on the S arrival, the slope of those two lines that are picked there is actually telling us about what the orientation of those S wave nodal planes are from a nearby source. Another application that's been important in growing in the oil and gas industry is geomechanical monitoring. So on the left, you see some work at ConocoPhillips where they fracked an area, uh, pushed in fluid, then let the fluid flow back out. And you can see very long time period changes there. But these signals are not super well understood from the field because there's no ground truth for at least some of those finer details. So on the right, you see an example of some synthetic modeling being done out of Lawrence Livermore Lab to better understand what we should expect our fiber optic strain rate data to look like when responding to these very low frequency geomechanical changes. Those low frequency issues being seen in geomechanics monitoring aren't just unique to oil and gas. They're essential to understanding how DAS can be used for earthquake seismology. One question a few years ago was if DAS is sensitive enough or not to record earthquakes? And the answer is yes. And so here plotted with uh, a Trillium three component post hole compact sensor recording uh, is a DAS recording of a magnitude 3.4 earthquake at 130 kilometers uh, recorded in Fairbanks, Alaska. So the green plot on the 
far right in map view shows the orientation of this trenched array, uh, which we designed to have two orthogonal horizontal components to record the transverse and radial components, which I'm plotting in red. So we can uh, rotate the seismometer into the direction of the DAS cable, and we see that the P wave and the S wave are really well captured, uh, both in frequency content uh, and in coda die-off. Uh, so the timing of this event, if you wanted to locate this event, it would work with, with just DAS. One problem is that we don't have a vertical component with DAS, um, so in this, at least in this experiment. So just to note also, uh, there were at this experiment, uh, not in this specific earthquake, but over several months, we recorded uh, multiple terabytes, up to 50 terabytes of data uh, recorded over two months, which, which accounts to uh, a few terabytes per day. So DAS is really a, a large data set uh, type recording, which uh, requires new methods to, to understand uh, how, to, how to process the data and make decisions in real time. DAS is really an array recording, so we record many different channels at the same time. And for earthquake seismology, what that means is that we can uh, detect the direction of wave propagation. For example, shown here in the, in the top, we're recording an earthquake, and because we have two components in the horizontal orientation, we can uh, essentially determine w the, the direction of uh, peak slowness and back azimuth uh, plotted in a polar plot below. So before the event arrives, we see a, a peak has a kind of a tracks across the array. And this is actually a car driving down a nearby road. When the P wave arrives, uh, energy is vertically polarized. During the S wave and also the surface wave times, there's scattering uh, back towards the direction of the geysers, which is the location of this event. At the Brady Hot Spring, uh, experiment that conducted by the Wisconsin group, uh, scientists from Caltech uh, used known earthquake locations as templates and the move out of uh, the seismic energy from those earthquakes uh, across the array to find many more uh, smaller events inside of the catalog. They were able to find a uh, few hundred events and uh, correlate that to the pressure of a geothermal pumping at Brady Hot Spring. In terms of the spectral content of DAS, uh, Eileen mentioned that it's broadband. And shown here, that Mexico event I showed earlier uh, has varying uh, teleseismic broadband frequencies uh, seen in the dispersive surface waves, which arrive with tens to uh, upwards of 50 to 100 seconds uh, period. This is really exciting from a seismic sensor uh, because a conventional geophone uh, is really a short period sensor. And so while we might be able to deploy large N geophone arrays, broadband seismometers cost uh, over $10,000 per sensor. Another new area of application for DAS is working with ambient or passive noise seismology. So one of the most interesting recent examples of this was a verification that DAS with passive noise sources, just using traffic noise correlations, is able to actually record data that can be used for surface wave inversion that actually matches exactly, or very close to, directly measured geology at a location like the Richmond Field Station. However, DAS isn't a magic bullet, it's still useful to consider the noise source distribution when working with ambient noise interferometry, especially around infrastructure or in urban areas, some of the areas where DAS is uh, able to be deployed that traditional sensors cannot. So here's an example from Garner Valley in California, where the authors of this study looked at asymmetry and their ambient noise cross-correlation functions. Due to the density of sensors that they had, they were actually able to tell where that asymmetry was coming from, and they were able to interpret the waveforms that they were actually extracting from their ambient noise cross-correlations. This is even more important as you get into urban areas where there are a wide variety of noise sources. Cars, construction sites, busy roads that are a little farther away, and where there are temporally changing sources they might have diurnal or weekday weekend kinds of trends. 
By having this kind of sensor density that DAS allows, we're able to tell what those noise sources are and whether we need to remove them. A real difficulty in working with DAS for ambient noise interferometry is the fact that we have to throw out some sensor subsets because we can't rotate these sensors. They're just a single component as opposed to a three component geophone. However, if you get into certain geometries, you can actually extract both Rayleigh and Love Wave responses. So the takeaway message is that most of our seismic studies today record inherently alias data, particularly for small scale earth system studies. But fiber optic distributed acoustic sensing is allowing us to be able to do highly repeatable seismic studies over long distances, with dense sensor spacing, and even over very long times. However, there are a number of differences between these measurements and traditional particle velocity or acceleration measurements. So we have to be aware of how the instruments change our recordings of our wave fields, the effects of our installation and our experimental design, and some of these challenges of working with large scale data, bigger than what's ever been used before in earthquake seismology. Looking forward, there are a number of people working with DAS data, but probably still too few people. It's important that we're able to get the resources for extreme scale public data sharing moving forward so that more people can be able to work with this data and understand some of these previously aliased uh, data sets. Here's a quick overview timeline of DAS papers since 2011. You can see early on, many people were working on VSPs, a little bit of microseismicity, and as those applications continued to mature and grow, new ones actually started to pop up. People started to look at surface waves with active sources, then later with ambient noise or passive sources, considering studies using helical cables instead of traditional straight cables. Also looking at earthquake seismology later, and then even using existing telecom cables instead of uh, fit-for-purpose installations. So if you want to see any of these publications, we've got actually a much more detailed bibliography over the next few slides. So I hope you'll pause it if you're interested in, in any of these publications.